Okay, so welcome everybody to our second webinar. So we are here today with Jesse Roux. Did I say it correctly, Jesse? Yeah, <laughs> okay, so Jesse, can you first, before talking about your research, uh, can you first introduce yourself and tell a few words about your uh, education path, your your college, where did you study, what did you do, your PhD? Because yeah, Jesse is now a postdoc at the University of Missouri. Uh, yeah, so hi everyone, uh, I'm Jesse and I'm originally from Brazil. I was born there, raised there, and I went to college in Brazil at the University of Brasilia. I did my uh, bachelor's and my master's degree, and I got my master's degree there. And then I went to University of Colorado for my PhD um, with um, where I worked with Professor Robert Davis. And uh, right now I'm, uh, I'm doing a postdoc at the University of Missouri with uh, Rosanna Zia. And how how did you find your your PhD and I mean also why did you choose the US and how did you choose the US and and the university? That's an interesting question. So going to the US is never uh, was never like something that crossed my mind before. I was planning to do a PhD in Europe uh, instead, but uh, I ended up getting in touch with my PhD advisor, uh, Professor Robert Davis, and we talked about research topics. And he was an author that I actually cited multiple times during my master's research. And it, it was someone that I was very familiar with uh, his research. And after we talked and discussed about some project possibilities, I was actually very interested to work uh, with him. And I ended up going uh, coming here. And how easy it was for you to, to go to the U.S. to, you know, all visa process, everything, starting the project? <laughs> No practical uh, so, questions we have here in the audience. I suppose we have a lot of PhD students, and so these questions might be useful for. Yeah, for many so of them. so my timeline was very unusual, um, and the whole process of uh, between applying, acceptance, and coming here was actually a two month process, which was not oh, what usually which is okay. not what usually yeah. happens uh, here. But uh, that was because of some details that. Um, and circumstances that happened at the time. And and what about your your postdoc? How did you find it? So for my postdoc, I had a list with some possible advisors that I wanted to work with. Uh, I reached out to them. I got a, a few offers, and uh, I ended up choosing uh, to work with Rosanna because of the specific project I'm working on right now, which is not what I'm going to present today, but um, it's a very interesting project about dynamics of DNA inside, inside of cells. And so I, I can see that in both your PhD choice and postdoc choice, uh, we could say that networking is important. So, and I'll come to to uh, my final questions regarding this. Do you have any suggestion to either current uh, college students, either undergrads or graduate, I mean, masters or uh, PhD students wanting, looking for a postdoc? So what would you say? Yeah, so um, for me, at least, when looking for a postdoc or for a, a PhD position, I think it's very important to like what you're doing. So I think the for me, the two main factors are definitely the research topic and the advisor, because uh, you, you have to work with something you like working with and with someone you like working with. This is, this is actually a current topic for uh, people looking for a PhD. Do you prefer, which one is more important for you, the topic or the advisor? Uh, that's hard. I would say it's the advisor. And the reason I say that is that a good advisor can make um, a topic that you wouldn't be interested at first interesting, but a bad advisor can take a topic that you're interested in uh, not very interesting, which just... <laughs> I yeah, think I think I think many PhD students can agree on that. <laughs> yeah, I completely yeah. agree. <laughs> I mean, it's definitely a very personal experience, but uh, and that's also one of the reasons personalities uh, is important are important. Yeah. Sure. 
So before continuing, does anybody have any question in the audience? Please do interact with us and don't let us three just talk. Okay. Nobody? Well, in that case, Jesse, you can proceed. You can start sharing your presentation and All right. um, go here to hear you. Okay, sounds good. Let me share, just share my screen here. As for as for questions, people do please do inter, in, interrupt Inter to to ask yeah. questions. You have uh, the best way is probably to raise your hand in Zoom. You have that option, so just to show that your you have a question. But yeah, let's make this as interactive as possible. Okay, uh, so let me just take my screen here. Um, I guess, uh, can you guys see my slides? Yeah. Yes. Okay. That sounds, so, sounds good. Um, so again, for those who just joined the, uh, the call, I'm Jesse, I'm a postdoc at the university of Missouri, but today I'm going to be talking about some of the work I did during my PhD at CU Boulder with professor Robert Davis and Alexander Zinchenko. And the topic is going to be the dynamics, shape control, and intermixing of a droplet in a microfluidic trap. Uh, so without further ado, let's start with some motivation behind this work. So, oh, okay, click here. Okay, so in a lot of uh, experimental applications in physics, biology, and chemistry, it's very important to have precise control of the position and uh, orientation of particles and droplets. And... For that, we can use different tools. We can use uh, acoustic traps. We can use magnetic fields to manipulate the particles if they are magnetic. Uh, we can use optical tweezers and we can use hydrodynamics. Uh, specifically, when talking about manipulating particles with hydrodynamics, that's not a new thing. And it's been around for quite a uh, long time. One of the earliest examples being uh, J.I. Taylor's experiment, um, uh, the furrow mill. Uh, experiment, which was designed to study drop deformation and breakup. And of course, as we are in the rheology uh, symposium, uh, this would also be related to the uh, extensional flow and extensional viscosity of emotions. Uh, so of course, one problem, of, one problem that this experiment has is that if the droplet is not perfectly centered at the middle, uh, it can just eventually escape the experiment and that's not very good. So later, uh, a computer-controlled version of the experiment was proposed by Bentley and Liu in 1986, which uses a linear controller to keep the droplet at the center. So nowadays, with the rise of microfluidic systems, it's no surprise that microfluidic versions of this experiment started to appear. Mm -hmm. And one of the most well-known ones is the so-called um, Stokes trap, which was proposed by Professor Schroeder at, uh, from Illinois. And what it is, is basically a combination of, uh, it's, it's a microfluidic chip with multiple channel branches that intersect uh, in a single region. And each one of these branches are is connected uh, to a fluid reservoir with a pressure regulator that allows us to control the fluxes in each one of these branches. And by doing that, we can actually control the position of the particles inside of this trap. Um, so this has been used for uh, different applications, including particle uh, manipulation, and uh, a four-branch version has been used uh, to kind of emulate the foral mill experiment and do some extensional um, rheology with, for example, cells. Uh, however, one thing that we noticed is that when people were doing these experimental, uh, these rheology experiments, they were using a four a uh, branch trap, whereas for many park manipulation, they were used to these more complicated six branch uh, traps. And what we thought was that, okay, so what with, uh, we combine these uh, more complicated flows uh, produced by these multiple branches with a deformable particle or droplet at the center. Can we get something interesting? And what we thought is that, okay, so if we can somehow manipulate the, the shape of the droplets at the center, we can use that to produce, uh, to manufacture an isotropic uh, gel particles, for example, for drug delivery applications. 
or we can actually induce some complicated flows inside the droplet and produce chaotic mixing for microchemical reactors. So that was the motivation behind the this work. So this work is not experimental. Uh, it's a numerical slash theoretical work. And here we're gonna simulate the motion of a droplet inside this intersect region uh, of, the, of the Stokes trap. And we're gonna see uh, what happens uh, if we manipulate the fluxes uh, in the branches, on the branches, and how the droplet responds to these different fluxes. And the method we're gonna, uh, so here in our problem, we're gonna model this as a Stokes flow. We have a low Reynolds number because we have very small dimensions and not very fast velocities. And uh, we're gonna use a boundary integral method to solve um, the drop motion. And so this is a fluid seminar. So a lot of people here are probably familiar with boundary integral methods. For those who are not, boundary integral methods are numerical methods to solve uh, the boundary integral form of Stokes equations. And this specific version of the method was proposed by us in uh, 2023 in our paper, in, uh, which is published in Physics of Fluids. And um, basically, um, this method, uh, this version of the method was uh, created to simulate the motion of a single droplet in very complicated microfluidic channels. So, um, so here we have a droplet uh, moving through a channel, and we see that if the channel is too large, uh, it can be very computationally expensive to simulate the whole problem because although the bound integral method uh, only requires the discretization of interfaces, if the channel is too large, we're going to have a lot of channel elements, and that can be computationally expensive. So what we do is we have uh, a moving frame that follows the droplet throughout its motion. And we first pre-calculate the external flow, and we can use that as a boundary condition for the moving frame, uh, which allows us to, uh, and the moving frame is much larger than the droplet, but smaller than the whole channel. And this allows us to reduce computational cost. Um, so basically we use this method uh, and by using this, we can solve the drop motion in different types of uh, channel shapes. Uh, and we're going to use that to simulate our droplet here inside of, a, of our Stokes trap. Okay, so uh, we can, by changing these fluxes, we can play around and see how the droplet deforms uh, with these different conditions. And what we can do first is we can identify different deformation flow modes. So by changing these fluxes, we can see uh, these more simple flow modes. For example, here we have extension, which is uh, a flow just like the coral mill. We have this shear mode, which is not actually a shear, but rather it's an asymmetric extension. And we have this triaxial extension that extends the droplet in three different directions. Besides these uh, different deformation flow modes, we can actually have translating flow modes that can move the droplet up and down and left and right. And we can actually use these uh, translating flow modes to implement some control in our uh, system. So as I mentioned before, in a lot, lot of these experiments, if the droplet is not perfectly centered uh, at the channel center, it can just cape. So to avoid that, what we can do is we can implement this linear controller. And uh, by doing that, we can we can see that the droplet that without control would just escape the channel by not being perfectly centered. Uh, would will actually just go to the center and we can uh, proceed with our experiment normally. So here we're using a simple linear controller that can be made uh, actually more uh, robust by uh, including an integral component. And if we do that, we can actually keep the droplet centered at anywhere we want in our channel for to perform our experiments. So, um, so now I'm going to proceed with some shape analysis. But before that, uh, do we have any questions? Uh, yes. Leah? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Xiao uh, Xiao Zhang has a question. <laughs> yes, um, can call me Eva. Thank you, Jesse. I have a questions uh, regarding of the model, um, the mathematic model. Um, yes. I wondering. Um, I think maybe I 
because when I trying to make a mathematic model, I have difficulty. So I, I'm wondering if you could give me some guidance. So for example, for your model, um, what 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 is you're having and what you're trying to use the mathematic model to to get to, to which parameter you want to get from this model and how you make that happen and what's okay. the assumption during this process. Okay, so as we're gonna show like in the rest of the talk, there are a couple of different things we're gonna get from this. Basically gonna characterize the drop deformation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when we simulate the drop motion here, we're gonna uh, uh, precisely characterize the drop deformation and see how it responds uh, with the uh, to these different flow modes. And we're also gonna uh, talk about how, how we're gonna characterize the mixing of the flow inside the droplet. So this is gonna come later in the talk. Mm -hmm. Uh, but do you have a question about the implementation of the method or just uh, what can we measure from the method? Mm, uh, I, okay, um, now I will wait for, for the later. Um, oh, um, oh. But another question is for for the control. You, you're, I saw you you're trying to keep the droplet in the center. Um, how, how did you make that happen? Okay, so we can go back and, and talk about that. So basically what I do here is I uh, I have this uh, queue, which is the configuration of flow, mo of flow rates that I'm using. And I have a queue knot, which is basically the type of, uh, of uh, flow mode that I'm applying to the droplet from the experiment. However, if the droplet is not at the center, I have to correct these flow modes to actually make the droplet move to the center. And what I do here is I introduce a simple linear controller. So here we have the horizontal and vertical flow modes, and we have a sim simple type of proportional controller that moves the droplet. If if we have if the droplet is not at the center, it will try to correct uh, the flow rates to put the droplet at the center. Oh. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Uh, so with that, uh, let's go to some shape analysis. Uh, yes, sir. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, so Shalbuiso from France here, and thank you for the presentation. I also had a question regarding your implementation. Uh, you were talking about Buzinesk flow at the boundary. And I'm surprised because for me, when I heard about Buzinesk, it seems to be applying to problems of natural convection. So what do you entail by talking about uh, Buzinesk flows? Oh, okay, okay. So what I mean here by Boussinesk flow is the analogous of Poiseuil flow, but for rectangular channels. Okay, so uh, we have... Know so, yeah, so Boussinesk actually proposed a flow solution for laminar flow in uh, rectangular channels, and that's what we're using as a boundary condition at, the, at our uh, channel inlets and outlets. Great, okay, thanks. So I, yeah, so this is not the the uh, uh solution for for uh, convection, <laughs> for natural convection. I also have a quick uh, question. So you said you need this criterion only for the particle interface and the boundaries, right? Yes. Uh, so just just to to be sure, you you have what about the between the the boundary and the particle surface? Do you have any? How do you solve the equations in that region? Uh, so let me go back here. So that's an interesting question. Um, so the so what, integral... what I'm what I'm trying to say: Do you have any lubrication flow there, and how do you solve it? The the lubrication flow we solved uh, is part of the full solution. So when we're solving this uh, this thing, the boundary equation, what we're gonna get is a velocity and a uh, potential density. Okay. So these terms are defined at the interfaces. So the velocity is going to be defined at the interface of the droplet, and the potential energy is uh, potential density is defined at the uh, the channel interface. By having this information at the interface, we can actually calculate the flow velocity at every point. Okay, so that comes from the linearity of Stokes equations and the fact that the that Green's functions propagate this information around. So the bound integration, uh, the bound integral method, it solves the necessary information at the interface that uh, you can get. You can use to get the flow anywhere you want. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Okay, so uh, with these questions solved, we can move a move ahead, uh, and we can talk about 
shape analysis. So usually when people are characterizing drop deformation, uh, it's very common to use simple parameters such as Taylor deformation, which is the most popular. However, Taylor deformation, although it tells you how much the droplet deforms, it doesn't tell you uh, how the droplet deforms. And in our case, because we have different flow modes, we want to characterize the full uh, shape deformation of the droplet. So to do that, what we do, what we're gonna do is we're gonna decompose the drop shape into a series of spherical harmonics. And this is valid for any type of uh, star-shaped droplets, which uh, all of our droplets that we're gonna study here uh, obey. Uh, so as an example for this application, we're gonna analyze our tri extensional mode. And here we have the droplet deforming uh, and forming this triangular shape. And this tri extension, uh, if we look near the center, the undisturbed flow looks like a de degenerate quadratic flow, which is usually uh, often associated with uh, the 3-3 three, three harmonics. So it's no surprise that uh, if we analyze the harmonic structure of our droplet, it's gonna, the main harmonics excited are gonna be the 3-3 three, three harmonic and the 6-6 six, six harmonic and everything else is going to be much smaller than these two. Uh, so here we have uh, these harmonics plotted in the graph. And we can see that uh, these harmonics, we're going to characterize the shape of the droplet by trying to, to use them to reconstruct the drop shape by adding them up. So if we do that, we can uh, add the 3-3 three, three harmonic, the 6-6 six, six harmonic, and we see that the drop shape almost uh, perfectly recovers the original shape. Uh, so we can use these harmonics uh, as quantif quantifiers for our droplet experiments. So here we are in the um, rheology uh, symposium. So uh, everyone here is very familiar with oscillatory flow and tri uh, and step string flows. Uh, so we can do that with these uh, tri uh, tri extensional mode as well. So here we have uh, an oscillatory tri extensional flow and a step string tri extensional flow. And we can see the harmonic response of the droplet in these experiments. So in the first one, we're going to see that droplet has a transient deformation at the beginning. And then uh, for smaller droplets, we're going to see that the droplet presents a uh, harmonic behavior, harmonic deformation, which is slightly in phase, slightly out of phase with the flux. And of course, this difference in phase comes from the, uh, the elastic behavior uh, coming from the surface tension of the droplet. And here we have a step string experiment where we extend the droplet and then we release and we see the droplet relaxing and we can use that to calculate relaxation times and so on. Uh, for the oscillatory flow, we can also uh, do typical frequency ramps and we can see that uh, if we have lower frequencies, the droplet will deform more and higher frequencies, the droplet will deform less. These are uh, pretty standard results from rheology. But it's interesting to see that our uh, harmonic structures can uh, characterize these results as well. And of course, for future works, uh, it will be interesting to see uh, if we do these with different modes at the same time, how this, uh, how the interplay uh, between these modes would work as well. Because of course, if we have small deformations, they would superpose linearly. But if not, it could uh, produce all kinds of uh, interesting behaviors. So besides that, we can actually mix and match and combine these different modes we talked about. And here uh, we have, uh, for example, a combination of the extensional mode plus the tri extension. And we can see this like kind of squished uh, triangular droplet. And we can also see a combination between the shear mode and the tri extension, which has this non-symmetric um, shape. And we can actually get uh, the interesting part is that we can actually get these asymmetric uh, steady state shapes by combining these modes, which can be used again, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, to uh, for manufacturing soft particles. For example, we if we carry monomers inside of the droplet uh, to the center, we can manipulate the shape of the droplet and then just photopolymerize and form these um, anisotropic gel particles. Uh, 
So when we talk about combination of the uh, deformation modes, uh, what we expect from this is that for small deformations, we're going to have a linear superposition of the harmonics, such as uh, the um, solution uh, for uh, uh, slightly non-spherical droplets. However, for large deformations, we can see nonlinear effects, uh, which are characterized by non-superposition of the harmonics and uh, the rise of new different harmonics that were not there in the original uh, modes. So we can actually do that uh, and analyze the spectrum of these uh, deformation modes. And if we do that, for our surprise, we saw that for moderate drop deformations, um, like uh, 0.3 and 0.4, that we can see that they're visibly not spherical. Uh, we found that the harmonics actually almost superposed uh, almost perfectly linearly. So for example, here we have a droplet with radius uh, 0.3, and we're gonna see that uh, for the tri extensional mode alone, we have this spectrum of harmonics. For the extensional mode, we're gonna have this spectrum of harmonics. And if we see the linear combination of them, they add up almost perfectly, uh, which is good because uh, it means that uh, for moderate drop deformations, we can uh, use these results to actually get a specific drop shape if we can excite this uh, these specific harmonics. Uh, and that's, of course, very interesting. Uh, and the interesting part is that these shapes have also been seen in experiments. So uh, here we have some experiments made uh, by uh, Ramachandran Group uh, in Canada, and they were published uh, very recently in physics of fluids. And here we saw that uh, they they were trying to excite the the tri exo extensional mode in the droplet, but because the droplet didn't was not perfectly centered, we have uh, a contribution for a quadratic term that actually makes the droplet uh, present these um, uh, non symmetric shapes, which are very similar to the ones we obtain uh, numerically. So, um, so now moving on, uh, besides combining these modes in a boring way by just like superposing them in a steady state, we can actually do time dependent combinations and get something more interesting. So for example, I mentioned uh, the shear mode that can be done in three different directions in our channel. And if we do that in phase, what we're gonna get uh, is a very interesting mode that in which our droplet is just gonna rotate uh, and wobble around in this um, motion here that I, I think it's uh, very interesting at least. So here, this is not a rigid body rotation, but rather uh, what this is, is the droplet is extending in different directions at different time steps, which results in this uh, kind of like tri um motor mode. Uh, so for now, I'm going to uh, uh, do a quick pause and ask if you guys have any questions so far. I don't think so. Well, maybe later, because uh, the, the question is, well, inside what's going to happen. Uh, for me, but because uh, I'm really interested in the mixing flow inside. But actually, I have a question. If your um, A over H, your confinement ratio is a bit too big, uh, you never try to do the simulation because the energy is going to be too important and then it's going to do two droplets, or can you simulate that or not at all? The deformation when it's too big and you have an A over H too important. Um, yeah, so uh, here we focused on droplets that um, that are big but not too big, but we can definitely do simulations for bigger droplets. Um, but whenever but... it deforms, oh, it was more like whenever it deforms and your ratio A over H is too large, uh, then you will have some, like with the big deformation, you have uh, maybe an interface that will uh, pinch, pinch off. And, yeah, yes. Exactly. Yeah, can so, you simulate that, or is it too? No, so so we we can simulate drop breakup. We can, um, 
but here we, we're focusing not to. Uh, the yeah. details about how to implement breakup are on our physics of fluids paper. And, but basically what it is, is that if we have neck formation for pinch off, what we can do mm -hmm. is we can like uh, have a plane cutting this neck and then we can just inflate two different droplets in each one of the sides and remove the original droplet giving rise to do two different droplets. Okay. Okay. Uh, however, uh, because we're using this moving frame uh, to track one droplet, uh, we would then have to have two different moving frames that would have to merge together. Yeah, okay. I see. So without the moving frame, yeah, sure. With the moving frame, uh, a little bit more coding would need to happen. Okay, I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, okay, great. So just going to move on. And now we're going to talk a little bit about the mixing. So, of course, we talked about uh, how can how we can like induce these interesting flow modes that will deform the droplet in a certain way. And the question is, okay, so what's happening inside the droplet? Um, and uh, can we use that to mix things inside the droplet? And of course, if the answer was no, I would I would not have, uh, would not been given this talk. So uh, the answer is yes. Um, but before that, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, mixing side droplets. So there's two different types of mixing. Uh, mixing. Uh, there's there's two different types. There's two different ways of performing mixing side droplets. One of the one of these and the most uh, common one is the passive mixing. So we have a channel or a geometry where the droplet goes through, and the motion of the droplet through this geometry will induce a complicated mo flow mode inside the droplet and will mix things inside. And that's one of the ways we can mix things inside droplets. And the other one is to do active mixing. So we can have the droplet staying still and actually perform a complicated flow mode outside. And we're going to see that things inside the droplet are going to mix. So uh, this has been a topic of study, study for uh, quite a long time. And one thing that we know is that um, in our case, uh, specifically because the droplet is centered at the, at the middle of the channel, we're gonna have a symmetry plane, which is very bad for mixing. Uh, so we're gonna need transient modes to perform mixing in this um, uh, in our inside our droplet. So uh, there are a couple of ways we can do that. One of them uh, is what we just talked about. So it's it was it was that uh, rotating flow mode. And here, if we have a couple of different tracer particles, uh, we can uh, see how they behave under that mode. And we can see that they, they're gonna move around. And uh, that, that's gonna be a chaotic motion that is gonna produce mixing uh, inside the droplet, giving enough time. And another way of doing that is by combining different flow modes in a transient way. So we can actually combine the rotating flow mode with the tri extension, and we can actually produce uh, an interesting mixing behavior as well. Um, and we can see how the tracer particles that were like very close to each other at the beginning just uh, spread around the droplet with time. And we can see that uh, by introducing more particles. So here we have a situation where the tracer particles are uh, distributed over uh, the bottom half of the droplet. And we can see how uh, they behave with time for the two different flow modes. And if we see... Uh, the if we take a look at the motion of these particles, we're gonna see the folding, uh, stretching and folding behavior, which is very characteristic of chaotic motion. Um, and that's also very interesting. So, uh, how can we quantify this mixing? So, the way we're gonna do to quantify this mixing instead of using individual tracer particles is that we're gonna continuously fill the bottom of the droplet with tracer particles. We're then gonna calculate what this prof this concentration profile is gonna look after a uh, given time. And the way we do that is by using a Poincaré, a backward Poincaré cell, cell method. And after we have this final configuration, we can calculate uh, a metric that we're gonna use, which is the mixing number, which was introduced by Howard Stone in 2005. And what the mixing number is, is a measurement of the distance between two sets. So if the mixing number is too small, it means that these two sets are very intertwined with each other uh, and that we have very effective mixing. Uh, and the reason we're using the mixing number uh, instead of other parameters such as mixing entropy is that the mixing number is uh, a 
permit that visually makes a lot of sense, and it has been consistently shown to be uh, correlated to other measurements, such as mixing entropy, Lyapunov exponents, and so on. Um, so here we can play around with some of the parameters and see how they affect mixing. So uh, we're gonna focus first on our rotating flow mode. And what we see here is that if we change our uh, lambda, uh, if we have a smaller lambda with smaller viscosity ratio, we're gonna have a faster uh, mixing inside the droplet. And that, that's kind of obvious because the droplet is gonna be less viscous. We're gonna have a faster flow rate inside, a uh, faster flow inside the droplet, so mixing is gonna happen faster, uh, and that's a result that is expected from the literature. And the other thing we observe here is that if we decrease the frequency of our uh, rotation, we're gonna have a more efficient mixing. However, we cannot go to zero because if we go to zero, we're not gonna have any mixing because it's gonna be a steady state problem. So that's going to be a, an ideal frequency in between, uh, which is going to be ideal for mixing. Uh, the other thing that we, we can see is uh, the effect of capillary number. So capillary number measure, measures basically how deformable the droplet is. So if we have a slower capillary number, um, a lower capillary number, uh, we're going to have less deformation and we're going to have a more effective mixing. Uh, and this is consistent with results uh, previously found in literature, but However, we're going to have another thing here, uh, which needs to be taken into consideration, is that a little bit of deformation is important. So because of symmetry, this specific mode, uh, this specific flow mode will not generate mixing inside of a perfectly spherical droplet. Um, so what's happening here? Basically, what we know uh, from our papers is that drop deformation breaks the kinematic reversibility of Stokes equations. And that's gonna be very important to produce the mixing. So here we have a periodic flow uh, affecting a deformed droplet. So if we had a perfectly spherical droplet here, what will happen with this point is that it would just go back to its starting position. However, because we have the uh, symmetry breaking uh, caused uh, by the uh, drop deformation, we're gonna go to a different point. And so periodic orbits are gonna become uh, quasi-periodic orbits or uh, chaotic orbits. And this will help with mixing. And uh, the last thing we can see here is that uh, this is no surprise that the best way to produce mixing inside the droplet is by actually alternating between different flow modes. So here we have the flow mode that alternates between the rotating flow and the um, triaxial extensional flow. And we see that even for higher uh, viscosity ratios, we can produce very effective mixing. Um, of course, we didn't, uh, we didn't do, a, this is not necessarily the most effective uh, combination of modes, but uh, one can play around with different parameters and try different combinations and see how it would uh, mix things in uh, their specific case. So with that, I'm gonna finish my presentation uh, with some remarks saying that the Stokes trap is a very powerful tool for particle and drop manipulation. And, uh, but there's still some, uh, a lot of applications for this uh, type of system that have not been explored. And I think uh, this work kind of uh, opens up um, a realm of possibilities for these applications. So with that, I'm going to finish my presentation and I'm going to be uh, more than happy to answer any questions you guys have. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, this was interesting and wonderful. So yeah, questions. Well, if I may, once again, uh, so once again, shall we? So uh, one question, which is totally useless, but very funny, I think. Uh, because you are solving uh, on these Stokes equations, which are assumed to be time reversible, and I don't know if uh, if it was also the case in the experimentally speaking, but uh, would it be uh, possible to try to mix and unmix uh, your droplets? Yeah. So, um, so that that's the thing I was I was mentioning, because if the droplet was perfectly spherical, yes. The problem is that uh, there are a couple of factors that can break the re the kinematic reversibility of Stokes equations. So, for example, it's known for literature if you have two particles um, uh, interacting, if the particles are not perfectly spherical, it's going to break the symmetry of the uh, uh, of of the Stokes equation, the kinematic reversibility. 
uh, if you have particle deformation, uh, if you have a force interaction such as a magnetic field. So these uh, kind of parameters that, um, because although the, the Stokes equation itself is time reversible, the motion of things are not necessarily gonna, gonna be because you, you're changing your boundary with time as well. All right. And another question, which is more maybe useful for the topic of the PhD. Um, well, so you were talking about uh, mixing. Um, what about uh, breakage of small clusters of, let's say, particles who may be uh, subjected to cohesion? Um, can, can you repeat the question? Uh, uh, well, I... to, to, to formulate it another, another way, um, it seemed that, uh, I, I don't know if you considered only the mixing of particles, which were well, its tracers, or if you also uh, looked at uh, particles who were subjected to an other phenomena like cohesion or something yeah. else. Yeah, no, so of course in real systems, uh, uh, if you have like mixing inside the droplet, uh, phenomena such as diffusion would play like a large role on that and would like increase mixing. In our case, we're just focusing on studying the advective uh, uh, mixing. So it's just uh, purely Lagrangian. All right. So these uh, the, these particles do not interact with each other. They do not diffuse. They're just tracers. And do you have any idea of the importance of uh, introducing a little of such aspects or not? Maybe not, I don't know. Yeah, so uh, there are a couple of things. So if we had, um, so if we had diffusion, of course, it would like just increase mixing. But if we had something like a uh, particle, um, if if these particles, for example, were like not that uh, not that small and they were larger and they like could clump together, that would of course uh, create like a correlation between them, which would be undesirable for mixing. Um, but yeah, that that's interesting. But I have no idea what would happen. Hmm? All right, thank you. I see we have two questions. So, Chao Chao, maybe you want to start. You raise the okay. end first. Thank you. Um, hi, Dr. Ajasi. I have two questions. One is for um. So I saw there's a figure that you showing um x axis is time and. Uh, there's a, a different mode. Um, would you please go back to that slide, please? Yeah, sure. Um, um, um I think. Uh, yeah, almost maybe, there. Yes, uh, I, I think. Uh, is it this one or this one here? Uh, previously, previous. okay, This one here, right? Uh, then before. Before that. Uh huh. Okay. Let's see. This, yeah, one, this here. one. Yes. Oh, perfect. Okay. So when you're doing the shape analysis, um, I wondering like, um, so you know the result will be some. You know, if you control different parameter, you will get different, maybe different sh shapes. Um, I wondering like when you're trying to do the shape analysis, you're, uh. You, you are getting the results first and then trying to see, hey, if my mathematic model or you know analysis can give me predict. I, I think maybe my question is like your model is more predict the shape. For example, it's triangle, it's a spherical, it's a star, or it's more validating the shape. So it, it goes it goes both ways. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned before, uh because these um these harmonics kind of like superpose almost linearly for a not very deformable droplets um we want to have like a target shape and by superposing simpler modes we we can get to that shape so uh of course here for the six branch stokes trap we don't have like a full control of all the degrees but if if we introduce more branches or asymmetry maybe we could actually get some inter more interesting shapes but uh, the whole point of this figure here is that, okay, so we have uh, a flow mode, which is very simple. It's kind of like primitive. Uh, and we want to see what's the response of the droplet to this flow mode. So we make the droplet deform and we get the spectrum. 
So it's mm -hmm. just like a Fourier, Fourier analysis. When you have like a, a signal and you decompose it in different frequencies, that's what we're doing here. So we, we got our droplet and we like decompose it. Mm -hmm. And and then we say, okay, so we have the three, three harmonic, we have the six, six harmonic and everything else looks, uh, seems to be very much, much lower than that. Nice, thank you. The second question is, sorry, can you go to the slides that you're showing? You you want to make some some um changes so that the uh, numerical uh, the the model will uh sorry, so the simulation will show some difference. Like there's a point then you you said like you will go back to another location. Almost uh, yeah, at the end of the. Yes, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about the symmetry breaking uh slide. Yes. It is the it is this one here, right? Yes, exactly. So so you see, um so I, I wondering um how 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 you decide that the next location is below and towards the right. And like what if I'm on the opposite direct, uh, side or like different location and it will give you totally different model? Like what would mm. make you to make that decision? Here, it's not a decision. This is just a fact. So what we did here, we started with a point mm -hmm. here. Uh, yeah. You can see here my my mouse on the point. So uh, we, we, we have the simulations for the droplet. Mm -hmm. So we, we're applying that oscillatory Mm -hmm. Try exo extension mm -hmm. mode, and we're showing that the droplet instead of if 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 the droplet was perfectly spherical, this would be a single point. So the droplet would just like go back to to its to its initial state. Okay. Okay. So it would just like be single points. Instead, what oh, we okay. see is that the droplet moves, so it has like a, a discrepancy. So in the next step, in the next period of oscillation, we go to another point. The next period, we go to another point, and so on. Okay. Um, sorry, Dr. Jess, this is, uh, you use CFD or this is it also validated by the experiments? This is CFD. This oh, okay. comes from my simulations. Okay. Mm -hmm. I didn't do any experiments myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. We have another question, Siddhartha. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Uh, so I had two uh, small questions. One is that did you maybe I, I maybe I missed it, but did you play with the density and viscosity ratios between the fluids, and how does that change these kind of dynamics? Yes. Uh, 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 yeah. So density here is uh, not very important because we're considering the droplet to be uh, neutrally buoyant. Okay. So that's uh, something I, I didn't mention, but it's uh, we are assuming the droplet to be neutrally buoyant here. So if we, uh, we're not considering density effects, but we are considering viscosities. Uh, so for example, here, one of the things we showed was that if we change the viscosity of the droplet, so if we have a less viscous droplet, we're gonna have yes. a faster mixing. Yes, yes. Um, right. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and related to this, I wanted to know, so basically for mixing in these kind of conditions, um, isn't it also, I mean, of course, not, not necessarily in your model, but let's say in experiments or so, uh, isn't like exploiting Marangoni effects useful? Because if you add surfactants or so to the system, which I don't know if it can be done easily in these models, but that can probably enhance <clears throat> mixing a lot more, right? I mean, than just shape oscillations or... That, that's, a, that's a very good question. We, we can do Marangoni effects. Okay. Uh, for that, we have to add a surface dynamic, uh, a surfactant dynamics uh, equation at the surface yes. of the droplet. Okay, uh, that can be solved by different methods. Our uh, group used to use two main methods for that. One will be a simple finite volume method at the surface of the droplet, but we can also right. use uh, some something we call least squares a method. Okay, which is another way of doing surfactant dynamics, and of course, surfactant dynamics would play a role here. But for this first uh, work, we decided to stick to basic effects. Yes, yeah, that's a very good, that's a very yeah. good question. Okay, yeah, thanks for the talk. It's very interesting work. Uh, yeah, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions? I see here in the chat we have cool stuff from James. Jim. And I think we can all agree on that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So if thank that's you. all, we thank you again, Jesse. It was great. Yeah. Uh, it was great having you here. 
and yeah also other people thanking you for your presentation yeah it was very very great and interesting you want to stop the recording here